All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for the International Association for Adolescent Health Young Professionals Network August webinar, Bold Not Boring, Presenting with Impact. We're really excited to see um, so many people online. My name is Natalie Yap, and I'm a paediatric doctor and one of the co-chairs of the International Association for Adolescent Health Young Professionals Network. I'm delighted to be moderating this webinar from Melbourne, Australia, and I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I speak from today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. The RAAH YPN and the panelists acknowledges and pays respect to the past, present and future traditional custodians and elders of the nation of Australia and the continu continuation of cultural, spiritual and educational practices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. For those of you joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome and, and a little bit about ourselves to start with. The International Association for Adolescent Health is a multidisciplinary non-government organization which aims to improve the health, development and well-being of 10 to 24 year old adolescents and young adults in every region of the world. The IAAH Young Professionals Network aims to provide diverse opportunities for early career professionals around the world to further develop their knowledge, skills and experience in adolescent health. We aspire to promote collaboration and build relationships between early career professionals and expert leaders in the field of adolescent health. So moving on to our next slide, this webinar is very excitingly led by three of our young professional network officers who have extensive experience presenting research to diverse audiences, including peers, consumers and policymakers across different platforms, including social media. They will share their experiences as early career professionals, as well as their practical tips and tricks that they have learned in their careers to date. This webinar is part of our inaugural flash mentorship program on research in global adolescent health, where 10 mentees have been selected from around the world to refine their research presenting skills under the guidance of well-established leaders and mentors in adolescent health. So welcome to our mentees as well. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping things. Firstly, I'd like to introduce you to our YPN chat box moderator, Suzanne Crowley, who is our current mentorship program lead and has been heavily involved in all of the most recent webinars, as well as our mentorship program. And she'll be monitoring the Q&A function and chat box. I'm sure you all know well uh, the functions of a Zoom webinar, um, but just as a reminder, the Q&A function is for you to ask questions to the speakers and the chat function is for you to introduce yourselves and, tell, and to tell us a little bit about why you've decided to join us today. The session will be recorded and if there are any concerns in regards to this, please feel free to send us an email and there'll be an opportunity for the panellists to answer the questions at the end of their presentation. I'll now move on to introducing each of our speakers and I'll do so at the start and um, so that they, as their presentation um, flows nicely on from each other. Starting with our first speaker, Dr. Stephanie Patridge, who is a senior research fellow and accredited practicing dietitian at the University of Sydney. Her research is focused on improving nutrition and physical activity behaviors for effective prevention of obesity and chronic diseases in young people. Her research is centered on digital health, and has a strong focus on research translation and youth engagement in the research cycle. She, is in, she has completed her PhD and presented 21 research abstracts at over 20 national and international conferences and delivered numerous presentations for young people, community groups and government. We're excited to have her on board as a community engagement officer at the IAAH Young Professionals Network. Our second speaker is Dr. Joma Maravilla, who is a public health researcher with a specialized focus on adolescent health epidemiology and program evaluation. He has expertise in identifying social determinants and mental health risks in adolescents, including young mothers. He also has an extensive experience in evaluation of reproductive and mental health services, as well as domestic violence prevention programs. He is a community engagement officer as well with the YPN. 
Our final speaker is Molly O'Sullivan, who is an experienced project officer with a demonstrated history of working within the not-for-profit paediatric and adolescent health research industry. Molly has expertise in clinical and public health research and research communications with an emerging focus on research impact to optimize the application of research into policy and practice, as well as ensuring research is accessible and useful for the community. We're delighted to have Molly on board as a communications officer at the YPN. So before we get started, um, if um, anyone who has a phone um, who is able to read QR codes, and um, we have a very brief activity, um, just one question. So if you could all um, use this QR code um, and we can also type in the code and the website into the chat. Um, as there'll be a bit of an activity shortly um, with Dr. Joma Marabilla's presentation. All right, so we might get started first um, with our first speaker, Dr. Stephanie Patridge. Um, is my slides working? Yep. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much, Natalie, for the um, opportunity to present tonight. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land that I'm presenting on tonight, which is the Gadigal people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So we thought we'd start off this um, webinar tonight by taking you through some practical strategies that have helped, um, I know have helped me when I've been preparing for presentations um, throughout my PhD and as well as um, in the four years of my postdoctoral fellowship. So I'll take you through some tips and tricks that have helped me. Um, so the first one is about really knowing who your audience is and who you're presenting to. Uh, the second one is around organizing your slides because I know that definitely helps me organize my mind and I think it also helps the audience with how they interpret and understand your presentation. The next one is focusing on a good succinct take home message so when the audience leaves your presentation they can walk away really feeling like they took away um, something that they might want to go back and um, deliver in their um, research group or within their um, hospital that they're working in. Uh, the, also the importance of um, preparation and as well as being confident, um, but I very much recognise that that is um, much easier said than done. So I wanted to start off with just um, the first one around knowing your audience. So Joma is going to go over this in quite a bit more detail, but I just really want to highlight in this section that even if we're presenting to different um, in different sections, there's also different sub audiences that we also need to consider. So if you're presenting to a scientific audience, that could be, the audience could vary um, considerably depending on what type of conference that you're presenting at. So for example, I've presented at conferences on obesity, nutrition, uh, behavioral conferences, digital health, as well as adolescent health conferences. And the audiences at all these different conferences are very different. So for example, at a digital health conference, that can be often a very multidisciplinary audience. And there could also be um, industry partners and stakeholders in the audience. So I would really have to tailor my presentation depending on the type of audience. As well, if you're presenting to the media, how you prepare, prepare for a podcast would be very different to how you prepare, prepare for a TV interview. And as well, if you're doing a presentation for consumers, it would look very different if you're presenting to a group of young people versus clinicians or policymakers. And the same thing for funding bodies. Uh, a presentation could look very different for a government organisation versus an NGO or a philanthropic um, funder. So the next tip is around having organized slides, because I know this definitely helps me have an organized mind when I'm presenting and hopefully helps calm my nerves. So I'm a big fan of using animations because um, just very simple ones, um, because these become the content and that becomes the talking point of your presentation. And it really helps talk your audience through the content of your slides and of your uh, research that you're presenting. And I can't emphasize enough that less is so much more. Um, a lot of people can get lost in a very complicated slide and they begin to not, uh, they're not stop listening to what you're saying and they're trying to interpret what's on the slide. And I think the last one is really important as well. So don't apologize for a bad slide. Uh, in your preparation, you can easily make that slide better and you want people to be able to walk away from your presentation understanding what you've been talking about. 
So as I mentioned before, complicated slides can lose your audience. So here's an example of a slide um, that I recently presented um, to the National Heart Foundation here in Australia around consumer engagement. So if I put that slide up just as it was, um, it's probably what you're trying to do now. You're trying to uh, make sense of what's on that slide and you've stopped listening to what I'm saying. Um, but my strategy with, with this slide was that I was only had a short amount of time to present this presentation. And I really wanted to emphasize consumer engagement that we had done in our research group across multiple different studies. Um, and there were two very different study populations. So one was in adolescents and the other one was in breast cancer survivors. So what I did was I used animations to be able to talk through each of the key components of the consumer engagement and compare and contrast the differences across those two different population groups. And I got good feedback after that from a lot of people saying that they were great, great case studies. So it showed me that they were really able to understand what I was talking about in that short amount of time. The next point is around, um, I guess, animations again, because these can really help guide your audience through your slides. So often when we're doing a presentation, our eyes will go from the top left side down to the bottom right side. So using simple animation such as appear can be a really great way to help uh, guide your audience through your slide. I would really avoid animations like this because they can be quite distracting and they can even make your audience feel a bit giddy. And then these, um, these become your talking points and the framework for your presentation. Uh, and then you can become less reliant on notes as you go through and you can use these points to help talk your audience through the content of your slides. So, I, so probably like me, you've been to a fair few presentations where someone will put a slide like this up. Um, the font's really tiny, there's a lot happening, there's a lot of data. And the next thing that they will say will be like, now here are the results. Um, sorry, but you probably can't read this, but um, and at this time, you're probably trying to interpret what's on that slide, um, what, what should I be getting out of this slide, what kind of data is important from this slide. And that's exactly what the audience will do. And they will um, stop listening to what you're trying to say and try to interpret what's on the slide. So don't apologize for a bad slide. You can easily make it better in the preparation stages of your um, presentation. So this was the same results as the previous slide. So I presented this recently to a, um, scientific, at a scientific conference and I had to change a lot of the language that was in that table because um, I was presenting to a broad audience and a lot of that information or, or terms in that table would have been jargon to that audience. Um, I also used images to be able to communicate this information. So each of the images here related to the term here and I was also um, presenting to a scientific audience. So I was able to still include odds ratios because they would have understood what that was about. But if I was presenting this to a consumer group, I totally would have left those off because they probably wouldn't make sense to a lot of other people. I think it's really okay to read slides because often when we're presenting, people will be trying to read what's on your slide. And then if you're saying something different, they could get a little lost with your presentation. And as well, I think, again, using animations. So when I presented this slide, I presented this concept first, followed by this one, and then this one. And I thought that was a really great way to talk the audience through the key components of, that, of those results of that study. So the next point is around um, having a great take home message um, from your presentation. So you really want the audience to walk away from your presentation, hopefully with the answers to these three questions. So you want the audience to understand what your results say. So treating people with syndrome X with agent Y produced outcome Z. And then you want them to be able to understand what is the significance of your results. So this represents a potential new avenue for, uh, for syndrome X. And you also want um, them to know why do they need to know about your results? So what, did, what was the contribution of these results to the field? So did, could it possibly change clinical guidelines or could that uh, intervention then be upscaled and implemented on a national level? So you really want people to be able to walk away from your presentation thinking, wow, I really was able to understand what they're talking about and um, really understand that key take home message. So the next point is around preparation. And I don't think I can emphasize enough really understanding who your audience are, because you really want them to be able to understand what you're talking about and them leaving your presentation really have been able to understand what you've been talking about. 
Um, I think organizing your slides is a great way to help your audience understand what you've been talking about. Um, really focus on a succinct take home message that your audience can leave with. Uh, practice. And the last one is around being confident. And I very much recognize that this is much easier said than done. I don't think I'll ever be able to do a presentation where I don't feel nervous. Um, it does take time. It takes practice. Um, but one way I've been able to help in, improve my confidence is being, is being able to say yes to opportunities. And you want opportunities that are not gonna totally throw you in the deep end, but give you that opportunity to help build your skills. You can also create opportunities for yourself. So you might be great at a particular skill um, within your research team or clinical setting, and you can have the opportunity to teach that skill through a presentation to your peers. And that's a really great way to be able to help with your presentation skills. And I think it's really important to remember that it doesn't come naturally to everyone and that's okay. And I think I'm a really good example of that. So my take home message from this part of the presentation is that applying these tips have resulted um, in better presentations, which has led to more invitations to present and has increased my confidence. Um, this has provided me with more opportunities to share my research to different audiences. And most importantly, it's allowed me to advocate for accessible and scalable public health strategies to help improve uh, nutrition behaviours among adolescents. So I was also asked to share um, an example of a presentation that I've done. And given that we're in COVID and everyone has been doing a lot of virtual presentations, I thought I'd share with you um, a three minute research video that I made uh, for the National Heart Foundation. And this was for a competition um, for funded research by the National Heart Foundation. And um, this was one of the winning um, entries. So I'll play that for you now and then I'll hand over to Joma. linked to how we ate during our teenage years. For today's teenagers, over 40% of their diet is made up of junk food. We blame them. Young people are constantly fed junk food advertising because big food companies know how to influence them. But young people make up one quarter of the world's population. So why aren't we harnessing the influence of young people to improve research that impacts their lives? My name is Stephanie Partridge and my research aims to improve the diets of young people by collaborating with them. Right now we're focusing on two major problems. Firstly, online food delivery is growing in popularity with young people. With the help of big celebrities like Kim Kardashian, it's no wonder Uber Eats is the most popular app. I've led a multi-country cross-sectional study to understand the impacts of Uber Eats on the diets of young people, and the results aren't good. Three quarters of the most popular food outlets were unhealthy. So instead of walking up to the local takeaway shop, so much more junk food is accessible to them with just a few clicks. Secondly, we have few scalable public health strategies to help young people improve their diet. This is deeply inequitable and will impact the health of the next generation. Our solution? In collaboration with young people, we've created a new program called Text Bites. It's a novel, fun and innovative text message program. Despite all the fancy technology, text messages are still the most popular form of communication for young people. And they're equitable. Over 90% of young people own a mobile phone and text messages are easy to receive and free to receive. We're recruiting 150 adolescents in a randomized controlled trial to see if this program will improve their diet behaviors as well as other lifestyle behaviors. Taken together, my research advocates for big food companies to take responsibility for the health of the next generation and to help young people now overcome this growing and intense influence of big food companies by working together to create accessible and scalable public health strategies. How they eat today will impact the rest of their lives. That's really awesome, Stephanie. Um, so I hope everyone really learned a lot of practical tips from Stephanie's presentation. So um, before I formally start, I guess, my, my section, I just would like to share, um, I, would, I would say the result of 
um, our mini survey um, before we start this webinar. So, so as you can see here, a lot of you guys mentioned population, graphs, methods, um, some mentioned about implications, um, or I would say discussion of the results. Um, so just to let you know the reason why I, I thought of asking you all of you to I guess, share your thoughts about the information that you would like to share. Um, I, I hope that my presentation will help you will, will help you filter down what, what type of information will you present to, to different types of, of audiences. So that's why my presentation today is called communicating with your audience. Um, and the reason why I have this photo shared with you guys, I'm not sure if you can relate to me, but I've been to different places where in, you know, I, I was trying to gauge whether my audience actually understood my presentation. And I guess I can relate to this photo where in, you know, I, I'm trying to gauge what kind of language, what language should I use, what, what type of pitch or approach should I use when presenting my research, which has a lot of jargons and, and complexities behind it imagine presenting your you know a, a year of of work to in within eight minutes you know it, it's really really challenging and then you need to factor in the different types of people or audience that you have in a conference press in a conference or in a policy forum for example um but i think it's really really important for for all of us to think about the purpose or why or why um, it's really, really important for us to think of why are we doing this presentation? Um, I think a lot of you might think of, you know, the first three dots that I have here. Um, but I think overall, it's, it's all about helping our audience or facilitating our audience to, to understand and, re and appreciate our research. Because I think if we help them to understand all those jargons, all those complex complexities that we have, then we will be able to achieve all of these first three dot points. Um, and so the way I would dissect this, this presentation or my, my section is looking at three, three angles. So looking at the format of your presentation, the language that you may use or approach that you may use, and also the types of information that you may want to present. And these are really, there, there might be some overlapping, um, I guess, concepts across the different types of audiences. But I think it's very, very distinct as well, especially with the format and language. <coughs> Excuse me. So I would start with um, by talking about your peers or your colleagues. And I think um, this is maybe everyone is already expert in um, or maybe uh, already learning to how to present their research to, to colleagues. Um, and like what Stephanie said, it's, it's basically, you know, presenting your research in a scientific conference. Um, or maybe defending your thesis, um, or you know, having a presentation of your thesis in the academia. Um, and the, the most common format for this is you know, presentation or PowerPoint slides, um, having a technical report as well. So I'm not just talking about PowerPoint or having a presentation, but even, I guess, a written format on how you would showcase your research. So a lot of you might think of um, publishing your research in a journal. And the, the main intention of um, when you present to your peers is basically, you know, you want them to see that your research has contribution to the field. Um, and so methodology is really, really important. So, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you guys can relate, but uh, when, I re when I peer review, <coughs> excuse me, journal articles, I, apart from the objectives of the study, I look at the methodology and see whether, you know, it's credible and replicable. And I think when you're presenting in a, in a in the conference, it's also important for you to really show that that what you did is is good, and you try to eliminate as much as you can all the different sources of bias, and you want to show that this research is replicable. So you want your you want your research to be seen as something that can be done and and can be relied on in terms of um, I guess the novelty and the new information that you're trying to present. Um, it's very, very different when you're talking to policymakers. Um, it's very, very challenging, especially if you came from academia. It's, it's important that you have a very concise presentation. So it's not, a, it's not just all about the length of your presentation, but it's all about you being able to really show or share the, the, the most critical information about the research. 
that's it because you know it's not just about the link the number of slides that you have it's all about the key message that you want to say or share apart from doing a presentation um some researchers also think of um also choose to present their research as, as in a policy brief when you know you try to summarize your research the research and also highlights different policy and programmatic implications of that and i think that's what the the policy makers are really really interested in some also uh, think of, uh, thought of, um, and this is something that I did as well for some of our government um, stakeholders or partners. Um, so doing fact sheets, some of them are, uh, I, they see research as a, being more relatable when it's sort of a, in, in an F FAQ format where in, um, they can easily relate to what they're trying to say by having sort of those trigger questions. So you need to think about okay, what kind of format will be will my audience um, perceive the information most? So as you all know, it's really important that you don't use or you minimize use of jargons. You know all those statistical stuff, especially for a statistic geek, geek or epidemiologist. It's important that you lessen um, use of very very complicated statistical explanations. Well, you can definitely make it make this information or explanations available if if your audience asks it, of course. Now, this is another temptation that all of us might have is to present all the findings that we have, all the different models that you have. And um, for policymakers, they're really interested about the best available information that your research has produced. And you need to think about, okay, which of all my findings, of all the gazillion of findings that I have, which will be the ones helpful for making decisions or for policymaking, or which will influence this person. If you, let's say, a hundred audience, you want, you know, in a way, um, you're targeting, let's say, this person, you've seen that there's this program manager in your audience, you know, you think to think about, okay, which information will be most impactful during that particular point, at that particular point in time. So some, some information that you might want to present apart from findings, of course, is it's important, as I said, it's important for you to think about um, summarizing the intention of your study or trying to showcase the objectives of your study. Um, and then findings, of course, is really, really important. But I think it's also critical for you to showcase the implications or the relevance of your research. So what can be done? Um, and when you pitch the relevance or sig significance of your research, it's important that you, I guess this is a strategy or a tip where in, you, know, you try to align your research or the implications of your research with the current agenda or reform of that government or let's say of that organization where you're presenting your research to. I'm not sure. I um, now for public community or consumers, I would say you can be as creative as you, as you want. Um, some people are using infographics, of course, that's very, very common. And I actually found another uh, group who use snake and ladders to, um, to actually showcase the research. I think this is from the University of Leeds where they try to explain the different experiences of young people and children living in poverty. So they use snake and ladders, which is really, really relate, relatable. And I think it, I think they were able to present not just to the public, but even for some policymakers as well. In that, yeah, in that conference, um, it's important to use really accessible language. But when you simplify the language that you're using, it's important that you don't really lose the meaning of your results. Um, it's really different, you know. Um, it's different when you're trying to simplify and dumbing it down. So when you simplify your findings, it's important that all those critical points um, is still in that sort of message that you're trying to say. So it's really, really important that you need, it's, you need to be watchful of, okay, is this information encapsulating or summarizing all the things that you've done or the message that you're trying to say? Um, these are some trigger questions that you may consider when you're presenting research to a public audience. Um, the first two is the first two questions here are very generic, whereas um, the, the 
question three and question four might be something that's very interest uh, where media will be very interested in based on experience um the public may not necessarily be interested in what you did basically methodology but maybe the media especially when you're trying to pitch your research to the media or even in social media and um, it's important also for you to share very very briefly your methodology um I've based on experience, I found that developing or having one or two critical sentences about your research is, is really important because if you don't make it right, you lose you easily lose the attention of your audience, whether it's by by writing um, or via an article or you know when you're having a presentation. Um, stories is more important than finding. So as you know, um, um, it's all about what story, what are the story, what is the story they're trying to say. So you need to connect all the dots rather than just having a shopping list of all your findings, uh, because that makes your research more relatable. Um, and I think use of appropriate language is also important, although again, it's cross-cutting, but particularly for when you're presenting it to the public, um, especially when you, when you think of um, having some cultural considerations, I think you need to be careful of the language that you use. So in, in summary, um, and I am using, um, I'm tr uh, thank you to Stephanie actually for um, sharing her slide and helping, um, letting me to modify it for this presentation. So to summarize it, to summarize my presentation, so for peers, it's very traditional. Um, methods is really, really critical here. Um, but for policy makers or funders, it's all about impact. It's all about the novelty, what's new about your research. Um, why do you think it, you need to show why it is important? And, and you need to also say that your research is rigorous. Um, but for a community or media or consumers, it's all about the story. It's all about that core message that you want to say. And I, as I said before, yes, you need to simplify your research, but you shouldn't, you know, when, as you simplify your findings, you shouldn't um, lose the meaning of, of the message that you're trying to say. So that's it, thank you. And I think Molly, um, you're next. Congratulations firstly on writing or co-authoring that paper. Now you may think you're done once you've received that acceptance email, but this is not the case. Writing that publication is just the beginning of your promotion or research dissemination journey. There are lots of things you can and should do once your paper has been accepted to promote your research and yourself. On this slide and the next, and as well as in the resource kit we'll share with you at the end of this presentation, is a checklist of options to consider every time you publish a paper. Now, you may not do all of these with every paper you publish, but you should do some. Now, media. Media needs to be timely. If you have a paper that's been accepted or you have nearly finished a paper, tell your organisation or your university's media team. Email them a brief, plain English description of your paper and let them decide if it's media worthy and then they'll help you with the rest. Your organisation or your university's media team may not know your research. So remember to take the initiative and tell them what you are doing. Write a plain English description and send it to them. It doesn't have to be the results. You can talk about the journey of your research. Or alternatively, pitch your ideas to the conversation or equivalent to see if they are interested. Other media often pick up their news from these platforms. Now, social media. There is no denying that social media platforms are dominating the digital space. In October 2020, the number of monthly active users on social media was 4.14 billion. So get onto it. Twitter is popular with academics and journalists and evidence actually supports that tweeting about your publication increases citation. If using LinkedIn or Facebook, post on your page or post on the pages of professional groups, interest groups and discussion groups. Offer to write a plain English summary of your publication for someone else's website or newsletter, 
perhaps a stakeholder or an end user of your researcher. As someone that writes lots of newsletters, we are always looking for content. So really think about doing this. Or better yet, email a summary to your funders. They want to know what their return on investment was. Who knows, maybe they'll fund you again. So when promoting your research, remember to think a little more broader than your immediate research circle. On the screen are some great platforms for academics to network and share their research findings. Whilst any social media platform can be repurposed for academic intent, these five social platforms are currently the most synonymous with STEM professional success. I won't go into too much detail here, but there are lots of platforms in addition to those on the screen. Each has their advantages and limitations and their preferred user base. When deciding which platform is best for you, read up about it and think about the audience you want to reach and go from there. Also, speak to your organisations or your university's media team or ask colleagues what they are using. Social media networking has been a career lifeline for many academics working from home throughout the COVID lockdown. By tapping in to this living online resource, it's possible to maintain and establish new career connections or maybe form online friendships during this difficult and isolating time. Now, have you Googled yourself? So we're using Zoom webinar, so I can't see your reactions, but I'm guessing most of you are shaking your head no. So I ask, why not? This is the first thing people do. So do it, do it after this presentation. Do you have a digital presence? Is it impressive? Is it accurate? If not, it's time to update those pages. If you don't have one, speak to your university or your organization about getting one. Look at what other people have written and borrow from good examples. You also need a bio. Create a short introduction for yourself one or two paragraphs tops. A good tip is to create at least two, one for academic peers and one for a lay audience. Again, look at what colleagues have written and use it. Lastly, get professional photos taken of yourself. It's no good using that picture of you enjoying brunch on any promotional material. If you can't afford professional or don't know where to start with this, use your phone's camera. The technology has proved lots and they can take pretty good pictures, as you can see by the picture on the right, a selfie in my lounge room. If your organisation has a media team, email them. They should be able to help with this. If you're a PhD student or employed at a university, they usually have call outs a couple of times a year for free professional photos. If you use social platforms, on the screen are some tips to increase your followers. If you're not familiar with the hashtags listed, three facts, five scientists, that's where you give three facts about yourself and you tag five researchers in your post. Scholar Sunday is where academics share on Twitter who they recommend others to follow and why. ECR chat is a fortnightly Twitter chat about all things early career. And lastly, well not lastly, don't forget to celebrate you and your wins. How people view you and your credibility is crucial. So it's important to highlight your wins for trust and for validity. Now, some take home tips, make it as easy as possible for people to know about your publication. Email it, include a link to it in your presentations, add it to your email signature. Media, it needs to be timely. If you have a paper coming out or nearly finished one, tell your media team about it now and work together to promote it. Elevator pitches, you need one. Focus on why your research is great and why you're great. Have one, practice it and get feedback on it. Create at least two, one for peers and one without the jargon. Again, look at people's reactions. If they begin to look a little bit disinterested, change tract. Now remember, writing lay summaries of your research requires a different type of writing, a more accessible language, and the emphasis needs to be on the impact and outcome of your research. Less detail on the statistics. Remember, this is for a non-academic audience. If you're on Twitter or another platform, 
include a draft tweet or post when you email the publication to co-authors, stakeholders, end users, your mum, and include a link to a post you've already published. Ask them to like it, to retweet it. If you don't have a social media account, that's okay. Your institute, your research group, or a colleague may. Ask them to post about your work. Again, email them some drafts posts that they can amend. So again, make it as easy as possible. Now, there are lots of social networks. Choose one or two and keep these up to date. And finally, take initiative and be creative. What about TikTok or Instagram Reels? Could these be a great way to embellish short, short snippets of science with music, with bold text, with emojis, without needing the experience of video editing or graphic design? And finally, remember Gampa. What's your goal? Who's your audience? What's your message? Choose your platform, evaluate and refine. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie, Joma and, and Molly for those wonderful presentations. Um, I definitely have learned quite a few tips that I'll be able to put into practice um, for future presentations. And um, so we might move on now to our Q&A um, component. And there's been a few questions already through the Q&A um, chat box. So if you think of any other questions you'd like to ask the panelists, please um, do so. Um, okay, so we're going to start with the first question um, and perhaps I'll direct this to Joma. Um, so often uh, research presentations have a lot of statistics and data, which, which might be difficult to interpret. I think Stephanie also alluded to this in her presentation. Um, so how do you prioritise or decide which data you should present in a presentation, especially if it's to a non-scientific audience. Yeah, thanks Natalie. I think from experience, I think it's it's all about, think, uh, you need to think about which one is novel out of all the statistical findings that we have. Um, it's also important to look at, um, you know, when, when if you're you know, a statistic geek, you know which one is actually showing, um, I guess, stronger results, I think. So it's, it's all about prioritization, which do you think will, will, number one, have an impact to your audience? Again, novelty and whether it's a strong, you know, that the, the statistic is really, really high, if you like. And number three is it, if it actually fits into your story. So it's all about making that story. And if you think you only have eight minutes, you only have five minutes, and all those other stuff doesn't necessarily fit into the story that you're trying to say, then you can actually remove that. It's very, very hard. I even had that just a few minutes ago for my presentation, but it's it's really about your audience. Yes, it's about you, but it's all about the audience and the story they want you want them to hear. Great, thank you so much, Joma. I think that's really important just to have a clear, consistent, message um, to your target audience with a shared narrative. Um, and as you mentioned, that does change depending on um, who your audience is. And we saw that in your slides um, earlier. The second question I might start um, with directing um, to Molly, um, as she did allude to um, ensuring that your research profiles are up to date. So the second question is from Amira Wadi. Thank you for your question. Um, and um, it was, how do you keep up with various professional websites and profiles? For example, ORCID, Google Scholar, LinkedIn, ResearchGate. Is there any particular ones that should be prioritized? Which is an excellent question as it can take quite a lot of time to update all of those different profiles. So we might start with Molly to answer that one. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's such a great question. And in terms of a right answer, I, can't, I think it comes down to what is best for you in terms of what platform do you really engage with the most and then I feel like if it's one that is that case you're more likely to check in more frequently um, 
at the moment, they're not the best at kind of automating, um, but hopefully soon, I think with improving technology, there may be ways where I know where I work, we're trying to kind of synthesize it. So it will grab from Google Scholar and it will grab from another program and import it all into one. Um, but at the moment, that's not a perfect system. Um, so I'll definitely, I would vote with the Orc ORCID ID first um, because a lot of other programs grab from that. But I might also hand this question over to Stephanie and Jeremy because obviously they are the academics online. So maybe we can ask them, what is their go-to to update? Yeah, so maybe thanks so much for that, Molly. Uh, maybe we'll start with Stephanie first. Follow yeah, that's a really great question. I, I agree with Molly. I find it really difficult to keep up with a lot of different platforms. Um, but I guess the key ones that I keep uh, up to date would be LinkedIn and Twitter, because I guess it's the best place I can engage with different people. Um, and then my university profile, I guess, is the best one to have a final list of all, all of the different publications that I have. Um, and I guess they're the ones that I focus on. I'm finding ResearchGate a bit complicated at the moment. Um, but yeah, I think just as Molly said, focusing on a few key ones that are, you know, of benefit to you um, and that, that you, you're always on and then you can always keep updated because it is really difficult to keep up to date with everything. And I think recognizing that as well, um, that it's probably impossible. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think seven is three. It's all about which um, platform you're really, really comfortable with. So, for example, I'm quite comfortable with ResearchGate and I'm getting a lot of distraction from ResearchGate compared to other social media platforms. So, yeah, and also I think it depends on the research as well. So, for example, um, several of my research, for example, is very central. I, I guess it's it's um, revolves around the Asian region. So I'm trying to think about, okay, um, you know, of all researchers from um, the Asian or ASEAN region, for example, what kind of platform are they using? So it's about that strategy as well. And it's something, yeah, it's all about where you're comfortable with, but also, you know, which one is actually the most impactful platform? Because you don't have, you don't have 24 seven to monitor all those platforms. So, yeah really difficult so do you have a wechat then profile that we can follow you on jeremia do you have a wechat we profile we wechat <laughs> don't want to say if, you, if after the asian audience i thought wechat would have been your oh one yeah one. sorry oh <laughs> yes i do i do have wechat profile actually because i have a lot of people asking me about my research from from china and taiwan so yeah Thanks so much um, for all of your answers. And I think um, uh, just on the, the WeChat that Molly brought up, it's good to be able to connect with um, other reasons. Um, thank you for your answers. Um, so I might move on to the next question, um, which is from Deandra Priambodo. Um, and I think it's quite a good one and one that I'm sure that we've all come across before. Um, so Deandra's asking for what your tips are on what to do in a situation when you're presenting live and the audience asks the questions which you don't have the answer for and can't think of an answer straight away, no matter how long you've prepared for um, and um, what kind of wordings do you use to still remain positive and seem like, I guess, you're in control of the conversation and narrative. So maybe. Stephanie, it's you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Anna. Um, yeah, that's a really great question. And I guess my strategy with this is just to be honest. Um, I think people don't expect you to be perfect, um, which is, um, and I don't expect an, uh, someone who's presenting to know the answer to every question. And I think my strategy is just acknowledging that, oh, that's a really great question. I actually don't know the answer to that at the moment. But um, if you're at a, physically at a conference, you'll be like, oh, you can, I'll be happy to come and chat with you about that later. Or if you're on a virtual conference, just offering your email address and connecting in with that person. And usually if you're a bit nervous and then, you know, the presentation's over, you be like, oh, that's the answer to that question. And you, and then you can email them and that person would be very thankful that you followed up with them. Um, so I guess that's my strategy is just to be just to be honest about it. Um, yeah, but Joma might have another some other tips. No, I think it's the same. Yeah, being honest is the best way to go to go because it's it's hard to even, especially from 
with me it's, it's hard to pretend that i know everything so um <laughs> and also it, it's a, i think also it's it's actually a good like what stephanie was saying about you know you can follow it up think think about it as, a, as an opportunity as well to to connect and have conversation after and based on experience um a lot of conference participants actually appreciate you talking to them after the conference. So I usually, if I have the time, I usually approach those participants when I wasn't able to ask, um, I, I wasn't able to answer the questions really clearly. So yeah. Mm. Great, thank you. Uh, so um, we might just move on to the next question. Um, and that is um, from an anonymous attendee uh, so um, who who said that they've seen a lot of presentations with slides filled with text from the top to the bottom of the slide um, so what are your tips for editing information and decluttering slides so that key messages are prioritized we might start with molly as she's our communications expert and then go through um, to the other panelists I was at, firstly slightly laughing just thinking that some of my slides had kind of text top to bottom so maybe don't follow but in terms of um, some great tips it is really tricky um, obviously you're so passionate and so excited to get your work online I think some great ways to do is that I firstly just put, put everything I know this is the others may say something different. I tend to overload first. Um, and I also like to keep notes in the, um, you know, the text section at the bottom of PowerPoint. And then I kind of work off the both of them and think, right, what can I say verbally versus what's on my screen and try to just kind of remove some text from the PowerPoint slide that the audience sees and maybe add some um, and then I kind of just work until it looks like to me it's a happy medium on the screen. Another great way if you have housemates, friends, colleagues, test it, run your presentation with them just to really check if the screens do look too busy, if there is too much of a difference between what they're reading on the screen versus what you're saying. Because as Stephanie mentioned, sometimes it's good not to have them too separate because people will get a little bit confused by what they read and what they hear. So again, take advantage of your friends and kind of look online, see what others have done. Like I love seeing other people's presentations and getting great ideas from them. Great, thanks so much, Molly. I think that's really important. Um, I guess um, we might just move on to another question just because quite a few are coming through. Um, so I guess related to formally presenting, um, we've had a question from Nima Haber um, who thanks the panelists for a wonderful presentation. Um, and um, she's asked um, in regards to presenting to different audiences, what different uh, presenting mediums do you use? Is it always just PowerPoint or do you recommend other alternative platforms? We might start with Stephanie with that one. Um, yeah, I guess for traditional presentations like this one, we've used PowerPoint, um, but before this latest um, lockdown in Sydney, I did a presentation for primary school kids and I used um, Canva. I know Molly has used that as well, um, but that one offers a lot of um, little animated um, different uh, graphics and things that I could do. And I was doing a quiz with young people around nutrition and healthy eating. And just putting a few bits of those in made the presentation a lot more lively and fun than a, just a standard static um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, so there are a lot of other, and Molly would have some great tips on this, free softwares that you can use online. Um, I'll pass it over. Yeah, um, just to remind everyone, we do actually have a resource kit that we're going to share with everyone that has oh. kind of really useful links. And I did just paste some to the chat, but yeah, some cameras are really, really good one as well, um, which I use a lot. And obviously Prezi is an old, but really still a great one. And now I'm going to mispronounce this, and hence the link is in the chat. Um, Pekka Choo is another one, which is, um, which is really good as well. Great. Um, yeah, I think it's always useful to think of um, what you also find as the user to be useful um, and to practice as um, all of our presenters have alluded to as being very important because you could have a fancy PowerPoint and um, it could be quite stressful if you don't know how to use different platforms. So it's always good to practice, but great to know that there are um, lots of different platforms um, that are free to use. 
Um, and Joma, did you have anything else that you wanted to add to that question? Um, I think the only thing that came to my head is make sure that your computer has the, the capacity to run those applications as well. Because you know, <laughs> sometimes you use your office computer to design those presentations, which is definitely high performance. But once you go to a conference, if yeah, if they don't have that power to, you know, the graphics and stuff, um, all the things that you've done will fail. So sometimes it's always go back, it's always good to think about have a backup plan or even just sim simple is also good, I think. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Right, thanks, Joma. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to get to everyone's um, questions tonight, um, but um, we will be able to upload um, this uh, recording if you'd like to rewatch it again. And please don't hesitate to contact us, um, and we can put you directly in contact with um, Stephanie, Molly, or Joma if you want to connect with them individually um, and to ask it for any personal advice. They'd be more than happy um, to email you. Um, in terms of um, the resource list that Molly alluded to, um, our team here have kindly put together an excellent resource list with some of the websites that um, were mentioned previously. So please use this QR code to access those web, web, uh, the websites um, and we'll also be um, emailing uh, that through to everyone um, so this comes to the end of our August webinar and I'd like to thank, thank all of our three speakers on their wonderful presentations and uh, which were uh, um, very insightful and I hope um, it was a valuable experience for you all. Um, we'd love to get your feedback. So we've got an evaluation survey with the link in the chat as we're always hoping to continuing to continue to improve our presentations and our webinars, um, especially around topics that are of interest to you all as part of our membership base. Um, and um, here is um, some information on our website as well as uh, Twitter handle, um, if you'd like to join the YPN to find out um, as soon as presentations are available. Um, and finally, a bit of a plug for our conference, which will be online, uh, which, is very, which is very exciting um, in November. So please feel free to visit our website um, and register for that. Great. And um, so I'd just like to conclude by thanking you all again for joining us today. And I'm sorry that, that we weren't able to answer um, everybody's questions. Um, this is just a reminder link that you would have received by email. And um, so if you could, um, at the conclusion of this meeting, join that one and we'll see you um, there. Thank you very much, everyone, and take care.